Yeah, I think there's um, a certain stress when you look at your podcasts and see 10 unlistened to. <laughs> and I've actually heard people say that they've done some studies into if you get too far behind, you unsubscribe. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You're more likely to unsubscribe than to clear them. So, yeah. So I found the same. By spacing things out, I actually improve my retention. This is Super Fast Business with James Schramko. James Schramko. Helping you build your business super fast. 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 James Schramko here. Welcome back to superfastbusiness.com. We are on a continuation with this episode. This will be Darren Rouse Podcast Experiment Part 2. And of course, in order to make this podcast, I need a Darren Rouse. Do we have any Darren Rouses in the house? I am here. There you are. (laughs) Now, if you haven't listened to the Darren Rouse podcast experiment part one, please go and check that out at superfastbusiness.com. It was posted on July the 1st. And as a time of recording here, we are pretty much a month down the track. And since that podcast, you have gone live and I'm really keen to know, Darren, what happened? Well, we produced 31 episodes of a podcast and... As this is being recorded, I think we published our 29th day in a row. And so it's been a crazy month of a whole heap of stuff going on. We also are two weeks out from our blogging event. So we've had a bit going on. But yeah, the response has been really good. I didn't really know what to expect from podcasting. Um, I didn't know. Everyone kept telling me, oh, you'll do great because you've already got an audience and you'll do great because you're doing 31 shows in a a month and that's great to get into new and noteworthy. But I didn't really even know what that meant. I didn't know what, and I still don't really know what's a good amount of downloads, but it certainly exceeded my expectations, I think, the loose ones that I had. Right. So in terms of metrics, are you the kind that tracks such things and are these sort of things you'd like to discuss? Yeah, I think it's actually healthy to discuss it because I don't see a lot of people talking about what's good. So um, I think we've done about 115,000 downloads since we started. And we started, I think, on the 28th of June. So it's it's almost a month to the day uh, since we started. So it's not as many downloads as we get visits on the blog. But considering when I started the blog, we were getting like 10 or 15 visits a day. It's It's certainly... A lot more than that. And there have been some episodes that have done a lot better than others. And it's not just the early ones. There's been sort of a few standout ones along the way that have um, had abnormally high ones. So I suspect that's just based on the topic. And probably the day of the week that they were published as well had seems to, there seems to be some trends along those lines as well. So in other words, you're getting several thousand downloads per episode, and some of them are probably approaching the 10,000 download mark. Yeah, pretty much. The first two are just sitting on 9,000 now. So it's certainly the longer they've been live, the the better they've gone. And, and particularly because we've done a 31-day series, they don't really build on each other, but a lot of people are tackling it as a almost like a course that they're working through. And quite a few people are behind because we've been putting them out on a daily basis. Um, there's been quite a few people saying, oh, I'm only at day 15 or I'm only at day 13. Um, so th- those are they're steadily going through and the old episodes are all getting um, listened to hundreds of times a day. Yeah, that's pretty phenomenal. I mean, in terms of stats, I've got some benchmarks because I have a few podcasts and I also have friends with podcasts. Mm. Now, I've noticed your podcast is often in the top 10 in the um, business category, especially the business marketing, which Mm. is probably where a lot of the the listener podcasts would be as well. And I think that serialized aspect is definitely helping you. The most listened to podcasts that I've produced have had around 10,000 downloads, but the average one is somewhere around 2,000 downloads per episode. Right. In terms of monthly listens, I'm getting around about 65 to 85,000 downloads per month across my podcast. So Mm. it's, um, you know, a couple of thousand downloads a day. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not publishing every day, but I'm probably doing three podcasts a week on average. Yeah. And for me, uh, I've got one podcast that's constantly in the top 10, that's Freedom Ocean. And the other ones sort of bounce around often in the anywhere from one through to twenty five for super fast business and and then a couple sit a little further out where I have trouble roping in my co-hosts 
uh, which has been one of one of the most <laughs> fascinating aspects of it. I, I seem to be one of the least busy entrepreneurs in my sphere of influence. Yep. Uh, so it's probably a good choice that you've launched this podcast without needing a co-host. Do you, mm. do you foresee having co-hosts? I don't see for having co-hosts. Um, I think we'll definitely incorporate some interviews. I've done a survey of our listeners already, and they seem to like the single presenter. That was the highest rating. I asked them, you know, what type of podcast do you want and listed out six or seven different types of podcasts, including single teaching, interviews, case studies, um, expert guests coming in to do a lecture, and certainly single presenters was what they wanted most. Having said that, that's all I've done so far, so that would be biased. But interviews came up fairly high as well, and challenges, they, they seem to like that sort of element of what I'm doing as well. Every day I'm saying, do this, and that seems to be going down quite well. So I'll continue to do what I've been doing, but also would like to do a bit more interview-based stuff as well. Although there's so many of those out there that I, I'm a bit wary about just going down that road for competing with you know what's already out there and some great ones already doing that. Well, it's a very common premise, mm. but I do believe you can blend them and certainly mm. what we're doing here, like this podcast comes straight off the back of a four-part life lesson series that I've published, which is just me monologuing things, you know, talking about influences that I had from my grandparents and lessons that I learnt in difficult business situations like the time that my boss spat on me. And <laughs> you can switch around between the two and, and I found that people like variety believe it or not I, i'm you know like mm. you can buy those boxes of cereal with one of each type of cereal in it and boxes of lollies with different types of chocolates in it i think if you can at least entertain people and keep it interesting then that's a positive but one thing that can't be overlooked with an an interview style podcast is the fact that as a podcaster you might start to draw in a little bit more reach from other people's audiences because inevitably people mm. feel compelled to share when they've been on a podcast and I certainly do whenever I'm on someone's podcast I tweet it and Facebook it because it's it's a nice thing to do and it's not taking away from you it's it's adding to your ability for people to go and consume mm. some content so it'd be nice for you to work out which people will resonate well with your crowd, much like you do with your live event. Yeah, for sure. And I guess the, the live event's another opportunity for us because we record all of those and, and have a whole heap of content that we could use in the podcasts as well, or at least to use snippets of um, and to be able to record interviews at the event in person. So it sparked 101 ideas for me as to what to do next. It's a matter of uh, trying to prioritize those and, and not take over my life. One of the highlights uh, for, for two of my podcasts were the live interviews at the event, which we podcasted. Mm. We did a Freedom Ocean episode at Fast Food Formula 3 in Queensland. And Tim and I, we really performed well with an audience. They were laughing at our jokes in real time. Yep. And we were feeding off each other's energy. And then a bizarre thing happened at Manly when we recorded a Think, Act, Get episode. And the, the topic was podcasting. We were going through how we put together a podcast. And it's the only time at any of my events where a speaker or co-host in this case actually just left the stage because he needed to use the bathroom mid-podcast. And it was all captured and uh, <laughs> it, it was such a... Hilarious thing to have happened, but it, it was all happening and, and it was being recorded at the event, it was being delivered live, and then it was captured on the podcast itself. So, you you know, never work with animals and kids. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Well, you know, my co host on that one, Ezra, it was pretty random. So, he just basically said, I, I gotta go. <laughs> it took off his mic. And, <laughs> It would have been even more funny if he'd left the microphone on. Yes, it could have uh, been more more than interesting, I think, or maybe not. What was the biggest surprise for you between launching a month ago and now? I think it was probably the amount of people that I got emailing saying, can I interview you on my, on my podcast? <laughs> I didn't expect anywhere near the number that I, I got of those and I've actually had to put a lot off. I could probably have done more of those than actual podcasts over the month. That was certainly a good thing and I'm trying to do as many as I can because I, I, I know that helps with reach but I also don't want to 
overexpose myself too much as well. Uh, I don't want everyone to hear Darren on every podcast. So that was part of it. I think whilst I knew there would be a lot of work in it, I didn't realize how much in terms of the getting the map ready and show notes and all of that type of thing. And I have taken the advice of numerous people and outsourced some of that now. So I've, I've actually got someone on team to essentially produce the podcast and she's doing a lot of the editing and show notes and that type of thing as well and also helping us to plan where to from here. That is a big factor and firstly, I feel very privileged that you've come to this podcast, maybe coming in the first one, planted a seed of an idea for others but that is a classic example of how I'm looking for content that is not done to death and not out there and I especially love case studies which I did with Clay Collins and we're doing together now, where we can see things unfolding like that serialized thing. We don't know how it's going to end. We don't know where you'll be in a few months from now or a year from now, but it'd be fun to follow the story like that 7-Up series. So finding original angles is a good one. Yeah. But absolutely having standard operating procedures and a team to sweep for you is the way to go. I have teams preparing show notes, One of the best ways is actually to recycle information from someone else's show, just run the recorder and send that off to the team. And they can pull out nuggets that you didn't even know were there. And that's actually how I came up with my Life Lessons podcast. It was extracting three or four other podcasts I'd been on, compiling the best stories and then making a a mini series for my own show Uh, but definitely once you finish recording you want to be able to drag that media into dropbox and not see it again until it's coming out on itunes it's been such a relief to do that and you know i get all these little pop-ups on my screen when she's uploading new things to dropbox and and that and it's really satisfying to know that i'm not doing any of that (laughs) so it's great and how many people have approached you for them to be on your show uh, not too many. I think that's because I haven't done any interviews yet and I kind of announced I'm doing this 31-day series. A lot of people, I guess, just saw that and saw that there was no opportunity for it and yeah, there's been a few people dropping hints, I, I guess, but yeah, not not too many. Yeah, I expect you'll get a few uh, and, mm. and what we have is a filtering process for both requests to be on someone's show and for people who request to be on our show. It's fairly rare that we'll accept someone's suggestion that we interview them because most of them are just part of a PR net and a formal outreach program and and that definitely means they're going to be saturated and everywhere else. But when it comes to people asking us to be on the show, our team will actually go and look at the site, see the last five podcasts, see if it's a good look and feel and, and a level that we would like our content to be on and then they might ask me if I'm interested. So there's a little process there. Now, having just been through this this situation of launching a podcast, what happens after the 31-day series? Yeah, so part of that's come out of the survey that we did. I think I launched that on about day 15. So we've had a, a good week of data so far and, and several hundred people have, have taken part in that. And we've found out quite a bit about our readers. Some of it was a bit surprising. 70% are female, which i didn't expect at all and 20% haven't started a blog yet which is kind of strange because it's been a 31 day series of things to do on your blog so it's it's surprises on that front but the by far the biggest challenge that our listeners told us about was that they want to learn about how to find readers for their blog which wasn't really a surprise to me because that's qu- quite often what we hear so the next I guess, series of podcasts, series of episodes will be on finding readers for your blog and we'll we'll be putting two out a week, at least for the next few weeks until our event is finished and then we'll um, probably do some stuff that was based upon the event and some of the content we collected there. Excellent. When you publish your podcasts, how do you use the primary call to action? You mentioned before that you have an action step prescription, so to speak. Do you ask people to comment on your blog? Do you ask people for feedback or ratings on iTunes? Mm, Yeah, we've done all of that. So on the show notes, there are comments. And the first few days, we had hundreds of comments that certainly tailed off. And they're trickling in as people are catching up with the series. So that's one of the calls to action. I'm trying to only do one call to action per episode, maybe two at the most. And for the first half of the series, we we had advertisers and they didn't renew for the second half. So that that freed up some other calls to action, which included buying the ebook that we had 
um, based the 31 day series on and then commenting and reviews as well so they're kind of the three things I tend to cycle through doing those three things I've also found with reviews that asking directly on social has been quite effective when i see people mentioning on twitter that they're listening to the podcast i often follow up with i hope it's helpful and if i get a response to that i then do a would you mind leaving a review so, the old two-step yep. darren two-step <laughs> rouse I'm, I'm proud of that form because a lot of people go straight for the jugular yeah. and no one likes they see that coming these days don't they yeah and look i haven't done it on every single one that i've seen but if i see someone genuinely engaging and getting some benefit i do ask for the the review because it seems to significantly help in rankings i've noticed even one review seems to bump you up a few rankings so i'm kind of trying to be a bit bold with that it's not my natural instinct to ask, but I, I've been forcing myself to do that. So that's been helpful too. Right. Yeah. I've always felt that download velocity is one of the prime indicators because you can literally see after an email broadcast, the podcast rankings surge and then it, then it sort of subsides back again. Mm. I, I'm really curious as to how iTunes works because everyone said 31 episodes in 31 days would really help, but I'm not sure it's really helped our rankings a whole heap because I wonder whether we're spreading our downloads out too far over too many episodes. I'll be curious to see what happens when we go back to two a week, whether that helps the episodes rank higher because so far we haven't had a single episode rank in the top episodes. And I wonder whether that's because we're spreading people so wide across. I think you will find that it will help because if you look at the top rankings in the sort of categories that you're competing in, One's like Seth Godin's Startup School mm. is just a – it's like a micro podcast and it's very old, mm. but it's often in the top 10. And then one of my podcasts, Freedom Ocean, is very often in the top 10 and it's not even once a month, that one. Mm. But it, it is the most listened to of my podcasts. So I think there's a lot to be said for having some deep tentacles. Mm. For sure. I wonder, um, with regards to the sponsorship, that's an interesting side note that you mentioned there that they didn't renew. What do you think was the reason for that? I think well, they've indicated they do want to come back to it. I wonder whether it was partly, again, the 31 episodes in a row and them not wanting to come across too strong to the listeners because we were topping and tailing each episode. They certainly said the results were about what they were expecting in terms of download numbers and that type of thing. So, yeah, I think they were just waiting to see what happens in the second half and then they're open to that next conversation now that we're at the end of the 31 days. Right. Well, just as a side note, uh, as someone who doesn't have sponsors, I found that the podcast is the most effective vehicle for selling event tickets mm. and especially putting a PS call to action in my broadcast emails. So piggybacking a podcast with an email list is a supreme way to sell tickets. In fact, I was just speaking to my managers in our once a week, 10 minute chat. And I asked where the sales are coming from. And my web team manager said, boss, whenever you mention anything to do with websites on a podcast, our sales support desk just lights up. Uh, if you mention that we have a podcast service that's not listed on our site, people start creating tickets on what what's the podcast service? You know, how much is it? What does it involve? If I mentioned pre-done themes. So I've learned that organic mentions and cross promotion of your own site is literally like interlinking between blog posts on a SEO level mm. and on a readership level. You can hyper thread your podcasts, retro mention previous episodes, uh, cross sell products just organically mentioning them in the show and of course if you happen to transcribe it then everything you say turns into seo fodder mm. yeah and we've certainly found that with the ebook that the series is based on with you know tenfold sales this month um on that which has been partly because we had a discount code but you know i'm mentioning it in every podcast as well, which helps a lot. So, yeah, it's, that's driven a lot of sales and particularly since the advertising's gone off, I think that's increased partly because I've got more space to sell it but also because there's less competing calls to action, I suspect. Do you think if you started again, you would go with a 31-day series? I'm not sure. I, I think 
it's a lot to ask someone to listen to something for 20 minutes and then go away and do something for 20 minutes, which is what the, the idea is based on. Really, I guess over the month we've created 10 hours of content, but then we're asking people to go away and do another 10 to 15 hours of work based upon it. And the people who are doing that are getting real results. Like I'm getting emails from people saying they're ha- having their biggest month of traffic and they're really benefiting from it. But that's a lot to ask someone who, um, yeah, they haven't signed up for a course or anything. So, yeah, I'm in two minds. It's it's certainly had a big impact on those that are doing it, but um, it's probably had smaller take up than it could have if I'd spaced it out a bit more. Well, I think it'll give you a good opportunity down the track to retro mention that course for people who are at the right cycle in their productivity window to take advantage of it. For sure. And I'm toying with the idea of setting up a, an autoresponder based upon it as well. So we could actually get people to sign up for it and then they get an email each day to remind them of it or potentially even two autoresponders, one where they could do it one per day and maybe once every week they could get one for 31 weeks. That's exactly what I've done is I've put my Own the Race course and Wealthification courses on iTunes and when people sign up for those now, they get sequential emails delivered and they can consume the videos, the blog posts, the audios in sequence Mm -hmm. and the next iteration of that will be behaviorally based video responses. So it will be a a course that is delivered when they complete the video in the Mm. series and that will fire off the next email. It won't happen until they complete the video. That's great. Yeah, very cool. I think this is where we need to be. And I've learned a lot about matching people's ability to implement and execute by studying things like video lengths. And what I found was short podcasts and short videos will have a much higher uh, viewership and that's where I think the podcast industry is very distorted you hear some of the big shows with three hour episodes they talk about huge download numbers but I would challenge them to show that someone actually listens to the whole three hours because I've never finished one of them Yeah, I think people start stuff but then get distracted or they've, their run stops or they have to go into the shop or they've arrived at their destination and they may never pick it up and it will certainly double count and when you look in the stats it shows unique listens versus total and there's a, a big difference between those two numbers. Mm. It's, it indicates to me people are chipping away at it but what I found with very short podcasts is people are actually able to consume it and when I applied the ideas about this to my training inside super fast business i actually moved our weekly live training to monthly and members all breathed a sigh of relief it's like ah oh, thank goodness i can now keep up with it and i can i can commit to watching one a month and implementing and i still feel that's great value but once a week what actually happens is that you create a bit of resistance and a little bit of um, a feeling of anxiety that, that people are not able to actually consume it. So now they actually therefore feel that it's less valuable than if you did it in a more spaced out period because now they don't feel like they're missing out. Yeah, I think there's um, a certain stress when you look at your podcasts and see 10 unlistened to. <laughs> and I've actually heard people say that they've done some studies into if you get too far behind, you unsubscribe. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You're more likely to unsubscribe than to clear them. So, yeah. So I found the same. By spacing things out, I actually improve my retention. And, you know, anecdotal evidence from when I survey my community about the daily podcast shows is that all of them say, yeah, I can't keep up with it. I've unsubscribed. It's too much. I think too much of a good thing can really diminish the value. So I think it's going to be a good phase for you to space them out. And as someone who's highly creative and content focused, they're going to be really looked forward to by your audience. Yeah, I hope so. And and I'm also really keen to experiment with the different lengths as well. So we're certainly 
hitting the mark in terms of the survey and what people say they want, but it'll be interesting to see what happens to the actual listening habits if we do go with a few really short ones, which I've got planned as well. I've had a lot of five-minute podcasts before. Very rarely go over the 25 minutes for a show like this, and we're about at that point now. And only on my co-hosted ones, if we're really on a roll, will it go past an hour. I think the record one was on my Kicking Back podcast, but we're kind of cheat with that because there's no premise, there's no structure, there's no point to that podcast. It's literally just kicking back and it, it allows us the creative freedom to not have any pressure, which is fun to just record a conversation without any agenda or any point. Mm. It's almost like a Seinfeld podcast. Yeah, and I guess people show up to that with that intent of kicking back too rather than showing up to get some meaty actionable stuff. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. And and even though it is laden with fascinating stories and insights, mainly because of my co-host, not me, because he's you know wonderfully interesting person, it's good to be able to produce something knowing that you can't drop someone's, you you can't disappoint someone because you never set the expectation in the first place. (laughs) We never promised this was going to change your life. (laughs) Exactly. Of all the questions I've asked you, I, I, I hope I've done the audience a good service and asked you the things that are important. Do you think there's something I should be asking you that I've forgotten to to ask you, Darren? I don't think so. I think we've covered the main stuff I was expecting to to get through today, yeah. Good. Well, again, uh, congratulations on putting a podcast out there. I think the numbers that you've shared with us, which is very kind of you and, and very transparent of you to share uh, a good indicator that you're on a winner. I think the discussion we've had around episode frequency and length and premise and topic could be very instructive for someone else starting a podcast or perhaps if they've got a podcast but not getting uh, the results that they're looking for. Maybe they, they've Maybe they've got a, a sounding board to think about uh, how they might change it or what they'd change based on the experience that you've just shared. So I just want to say that uh, on behalf of the listener, we really appreciate your contribution, Darren. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on two times. It's been uh, great to chat again. Thank you. Discover how to build your business super fast. Check out superfastbusiness.com. Thank you.